Hello and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'll be talking about Season 8, Episode 3, The Bizarro Jerry. Hello everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. I am doing all right. I am uh, in an empty house, which I have to admit is the best sometimes. I know a lot of you can relate out there. Um, From COVID times, my husband's been working from home and the man is on conference calls all the live long day. So even though he has his own office, um, they're just loud. He's a loud person. The calls are at full volume. Um, <laughs> so it seems like no matter where I go in the house, I can just always hear him. Anyway, um, complaining about husbands. Well, how novel. Uh, no, I'm not complaining. But anyway, he has an offsite meeting today. And so he's out of the house. And so I can record comfortably at my desk versus in my closet. Um, because if I was at my desk recording while he was home, in the background, you would hear a bunch of corporate gibberish, like a faint sound of it throughout the entire podcast. So I'm sparing you that. It does sound better in my closet, I must admit, but this is so boring. I'm so sorry. I am just glad that I have some peace and quiet. Kids are at school. Husband's out of the house. Yeah, it's uh, it's a good day. Something I wanted to mention The new season of Julia Louis-Dreyfus's incredible podcast called Wiser Than Me uh, just premiered, the second season, and um, it premiered with Sally Field. Now, I haven't listened to the episode yet. I've been a little bit busy, but I I did start listening to it right before I started this recording. And lo and behold, JLD starts out the episode of her second season talking about playing Elaine. I was like, holy shit, (laughs) she's totally going into what it was like to play Elaine, why she took the role, how she got the role. So we've gone over that. I say we like there's other people here. I have gone over that um, many times on this podcast, kind of, you know, the way Julia Louis-Dreyfus got on the show, why they wrote her into the show. So I'm not going to play what she says about that. But and if you haven't heard it, I suggest you go back to um, earlier episodes. Just binge this entire podcast. What else do you have to do? I know nothing as important as that. Anyway, back to what JLD was talking about. She um, she mentions that she had just recently watched, after so long, uh, what, her favorite episode of Seinfeld, which is The Contest. So she goes into just how how hilarious that episode is. I'm going to play a little bit of what she said, because it's literally the essence of why I love her and why I started this damn podcast. So here we go. But here's the crazy thing I started thinking about as I watched it all these decades later. There's a very subtle, wonderful thing happening underneath the comedy here. Something new and unique. Most sitcoms of the era doing an episode like this would have made some joke uh, a joke like uh, they would have had Elaine wear something revealing and then she'd look so much hotter than usual, so much so that one of the guys would make it some joke about masturbating to the thought of her and then a contest between the three guys not to masturbate, thinking about her might emerge. That's a sort of you know, crappy, racy storyline that I can see being told on about 10 sitcoms that I can think of. But on Seinfeld... Elaine was in the contest with the other guys. She wasn't a woman, in quotes. She was just another human being with a very basic equity, the equity of sexual desire. It's a sexual subject, sure, but it's equal opportunity. It's not gender-based. It's just human. This was absolutely groundbreaking and hysterical and wonderful. Wow. I mean, I just... (laughs) <laughs> what she just said in that in that short clip is the essence of why I love Elaine and why she had such a big impact not only in my life but in a, in a, in the way I wanted to develop comedy, perform comedy because it was 
not about gender. It was about a human experience that happens to be occurring in someone who identifies as female. Um, so it just was, I, <laughs> I was listening to this, you know, in the mirror looking and doing my makeup. And I'm just kind of like, holy shit, she is really summing up the essence of why I do so many things in my life and how it, how her performance, how they wrote her, how Elaine Bennis impacted me. And I'm sure so many other people out there of my generation. And it's really significant. And it kind of, I don't know, kind of boosted me to, uh, not that I wasn't going to keep going with this podcast, but it definitely was like, I'm doing this for a really fucking good reason. And it's because Elaine Bennis broke so many barriers. Cool. Um, so moving on, I just, now my second banter point seems just so whatever, mild. Um, <laughs> I had three auditions to record this week, so it's been a productive week. All right, that was boring. Let's move on and just get into this episode. All right, the synopsis for The Bizarro Jerry is as follows. Elaine's new friends are the exact opposites of George, Kramer, and Jerry. Kramer becomes mistaken for an office employee and decides to stick with it. Jerry dates an attractive woman with the hands of a man. George uses deception to gain access to a nightclub where high-priced models hang out. This episode was written by David Mandel. All right, uh, we start out, again, our cold open, no more stand-up. George and Jerry are sitting kind of in this like outdoor cafe, and <laughs> Jerry's just throwing different scenarios at George. He says, okay, you're abducted by aliens. Now, would you rather be in the alien zoo or circus? Well, George says, I got to say zoo. You know, I can keep my own schedule. He doesn't have to do any tricks. And Jerry's kind of baffled. Well, you, you'd get to see the whole planet on the on the circus train <laughs> if you were in the circus. At least it's show business. And then George brings up, well, hey, they might even put a woman in there with me to see if I could uh, mate with her. Well, what if she has no interest in you? Well, then basically I'm in the same place I am now. At least I got a ride on a spaceship. Okay, next we are at the Brant Leland office. Kramer, George, and Jerry exit the elevator, and George has taken them here because Kramer needs to use the bathroom, and he tells him it's the best bathroom in Midtown. Kramer's like, what? <laughs> Jerry just says, he knows. George points him to where he can find the bathroom, and he just keeps bragging about it. High ceilings, a flush like a jet engine. So Kramer's about to go, and he tells the guys, you shouldn't wait. George says, you sure? Jerry once again says, he knows. Yeah, Kramer's got a big dump to take, I'm pretty sure. Kramer exits and a beautiful receptionist walks in. Whoa, Jerry and George are mesmerized. Jerry suggests that George use his engagement story to talk to her. George is about to and then turns back around, says, won't work. Are you sure? He knows. All right, next we are at Reggie's Diner. Elaine tells Kevin how she really likes him, but... She thinks that they're better off as friends. And she tries to go on, but then takes a bite of her sandwich and it just grosses her out. She says the tuna tastes like an old sponge. Kevin kind of takes this in and he, and he likes it. He says, why not, friends? I might like to try that, like you and Jerry. Uh, my take on this scene, uh, very short scene, short like Elaine's hair, now, just a reminder, she cut her hair into like a boy short do in the Soulmate episode last week. Um, so I'm not sure how much time has elapsed <laughs> since that vasectomy uh, waiting room scene, but obviously enough for her hair to grow out to this awful, like puffed out style. It is so bad. <laughs> I do like the style for the rest of the episode where it's like sort of pinned back. Like that looks absolutely adorable on her. And once again, I want to state for the record, which I have over and over again, what record? I don't know, but I'm saying it again. JLD is an incredibly beautiful woman. It's very hard to make her look bad. But this style in this, the beginning of this episode, it's, it's like jarring. Anyway, I don't, think it would make sense that her hair would have grown out this much, but I don't even care. I don't care that it makes no sense. I could not handle that short hair on Elaine. As I said last week, that was traumatic for me back in 1996. I could not handle it. I was like, please don't have her hair like this for the rest of the season. <laughs> anyway, not much to this scene, except that we see that she dumps Kevin and that he's excited to be friends and that Reggie's food 
a sucks. All right, next, we're back at Brant Leland, and we hear the toilet flush, the jet engine flush, and a woo from Kramer. He exits the bathroom, and there's an office worker at a copy machine, just super frustrated. He says, the damn thing's jammed again. Well, Kramer approaches and says, you know what happens to these things? The rollers get flat spots. So he's trying to fix it by basically punching it. And then another employee comes out of her room and says urgently that Leland wants everyone in the conference room now. The copy machine guy tells Kramer, hey, we better go. (laughs) So Kramer does, just joins the crowd into the conference room. All right, next we're at Monks. Elaine tells Jerry that he should really go out with her friend Jillian, who writes for the L.L. Bean catalog. He's like, I don't know. Do you have a... And then Elaine shoves a picture in his face, knowing he would ask. He's like, huh, not bad. He starts asking more questions, and she says her stats are on the back. Serious boyfriend, 92 to 95, owns her own car. Favorite president, James Polk. (laughs) George asks to see the picture. Jerry asks Elaine how it went with Kevin. Did you steal toe his ass all the way back to Kentucky? She starts laughing. She says, you won't believe it. I told him I just want to be friends. He's fine with it. He really wants to be friends. Why would anyone want a friend? (laughs) <laughs> what's the deal? Sorry, that sounded very much like a <laughs> stereotypical Jerry Seinfeld impression. I can't help it sometimes. She's like, oh, okay, well, it's not that bad. He said he'd even go with me to the Museum of Miniatures. This is something you would never, ever do, she says to Jerry. And he's just like, everything is just so small. I'm stupid. <laughs> George, his wheels are turning. He says, you know, if I told my engagement story to that receptionist and I showed this picture and said it was my fiance, Jerry and Elaine aren't really getting it. And he explains that women like that are part of a secret tribe living in a forbidden city. And people like me haven't been inside for thousands of years. He's like, if I show her this picture, it's like I've already been with one of her own. My hand's been stamped. I come and go as I please. Elaine says, well, you cracked it. I warned the queen you were getting close, and now we have to move the whole damn forbidden city. George gets up and asks if he can keep the picture. She says, no, I need it. He says, thanks, and exits with it. All right, my take on this scene, first of all, very relieved. The hair is better. It's all pinned back, like I said. I I like that style much better. Uh, Great moment when she has that picture ready to show Jerry (laughs) and the stats. (laughs) The stats are like so random and weird, but I like it. I think it's good. like favorite president. She has a car and serious boyfriend. Like they get more and more ridiculous from, okay, you want to know about a past relationship. Cool. I guess she has a car. And then why the hell do I need to know about James Polk? So Elaine tells Jerry here, you know, that she and Kevin are going to be friends and he will be the friend who will do things that Jerry would never do, like the Museum of Miniatures that they use as an example here. And I love this concept of another ex-boyfriend of Elaine's being a platonic friend. Before we even get to the bizarro Jerry concept, this is still interesting. I'm interested. Like, how is she going to be friends with another ex? Like, how is this going to, you know, differ from Jerry? And... I never get sick of how Jerry says it's stupid (laughs) about the Museum of Miniatures. Everything's just so small. Oh, I love it. And we have feeling herself Elaine. She emerges. I love how she lumps herself in with the gorgeous women of the secret tribe. (laughs) I just love it. And I also love, I have to say, that Jerry and George don't deny it and they don't make fun of her. I mean, first of all, because you can't. Of course, she is a part of this tribe. But I think it could have been a very easy joke, like them ripping on her, which I wouldn't have hated either. But I like that they just let it lie. You know, they're just like, all right, we're not going to deny that you are a resident of that forbidden city. Also, I really, I really believe in this theory. I think it holds water that once you date someone who is quote unquote out of your league, suddenly you become attractive to others in that category. I've seen it with so many dudes. And I have to say, like a lot of it was in high school, a little in college, but I remember there were dudes in high school who legitimately were gross and disgusting. Like they didn't shower. They were, um, sorry, but like not fit or like just they didn't fit the stereotypical like attractiveness that you would think would be the equivalent to some of like the most beautiful girls in my school. Um, But once like, One of those girls who I just believe 
didn't have enough self-worth to be like, I could do better, um, dated these guys, like they would just make the rounds. And I'm like, what? What am I missing? Are these? <laughs> I do not see it. Oh my God. I, I still remember there was one guy who proudly wore just baggy jeans with the crotch ripped open, just <laughs> ripped open. He used to like lay on the floor in the hallways, like after school, I don't know, waiting for the bus, waiting for his friends. And like, there were his boxers. I just, I, it was he, and he was one of the hottest commodities of like dating amongst the like pretty girls in our school. I, I just did not get it. Anyway, that, so I think that's a very true theory. I love how it's presented. I love the Forbidden City, Secret Tribe. I love all those analogies. And also interesting, it really doesn't work the other way around. Hmm, something to think about. All right, next we're back at Brant Leland. George enters and tells the receptionist that he has a meeting with Art Vandalay. She says, sorry, there's not a Mr. Art Vandalay here. So he takes out his wallet to check that he has the right name. And oops, he accidentally hmm, drops the picture of Jillian on her desk. The receptionist picks it up and says, wow, she's beautiful. Who is she? Well, if you must know, that was my fiance, Susan. May she rest in peace. Oh, I'm so sorry. She was lovely. And she introduces herself with a big smile. I'm Amanda. And then we shift focus to the back where Kramer comes out with a group of employees from the conference room. And one of them says, great work, K-Man. <laughs> They're all on their way to the elevator. And Kramer's just loving it. He's like, you know what they say? You don't sell the steak. You sell the sizzle. And they all laugh. And George just slowly turns around, realizing that that's Kramer's voice. He's still here. <laughs> The actress in this scene is Justina Vale. She plays Amanda, and she's also appeared in Jerry Maguire, Seven Days, and Kiss the Girls. And I think she's fine. You know, she fulfills the character, uh, what the character calls for. But again, it's a pretty thinly written female character, per usual. All the love interests are usually like that. I thought this was interesting in her background. She left the business in 2001 to pursue a career as a life coach and hypnotherapist and now has her own practice in Los Angeles. Good for her. All right, next we are at a restaurant. Jerry arrives for his date with Jillian. She extends her hand for a handshake and says, nice to meet you. Jerry grabs the hand and we get a close up of a huge chunky hand and he is very disturbed. The actress here is Kristen Bauer. Uh, she's appeared in a lot of movies and television, most notably True Blood, uh, Once Upon a Time, and Fifty First Dates. And um, I think she's totally fine. You know, another female character written with little to no personality. I mean, it's the whole man hands thing, but there's nothing in her performance that enhances or detracts from that. Um, in fact, I think the star of the episode, <laughs> one of the stars of the episode, <laughs> is the man they hired to be the hands. Um, so she does totally fine with what she's given. Um, man, I, I was looking at some recent photos of her and she looks totally different. She is definitely a fan of the fillers. No judgment, just an observation. All right, next we are at Monk's. Jerry and Elaine are sitting at the counter and Jerry is very disturbed. He says, she had man hands. Elaine says, man hands? The hands of a man. She's like a creature out of Greek mythology, part woman, part horrible beast. Elaine's just like, oh my God, um, would you prefer it if she had no hands at all? What would she have? Hooks? Do, um, do hooks make it more attractive, Jerry? Kind of cool looking. Well, Elaine's had enough. She gets up to leave and confirms that Jerry is going to be picking her up the next day in White Plains. He says, yep. She tells him she has five huge boxes of buttons. Well, if you need an extra pair of hands, I know someone you could call. Jerry! <laughs> she reprimands him. All right, my take on this scene. This is one of my favorite scenes from the entire series. Both JLD and Jerry Seinfeld are so funny in this scene. I, I love how JLD just plays this so exhausted with Jerry and his tendencies to pick apart women. It's just, it's such a great display of how different Jerry is from Kevin. The shallowness, you know, which is what she's know. she's always known this about Jerry. She's made comments about it, but I mean, it's clearly wearing on her. Um, and the way she delivers would, uh, would hooks 
make it more attractive, Jerry. <laughs> like, it's so fun. There are so many emotions in that delivery. She's sort of humoring him. There's so much frustration. It's like almost like she's in physical pain with her with her face and her hands. Like, she's like, oh my God, wh- why am I even friends with you? Oh, and an often quoted line in our house is... <laughs> Kind of cool looking. I have to shout out Jerry Seinfeld because he really brings it in this episode. It's one of the funniest performances of the series. We also learn here that Elaine is depending on Jerry for a ride from White Plains. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Kramer is dressed in a business suit and making breakfast and the tea kettle is going off. Jerry comes stumbling out of his room so confused about what what the hell is going on. Kramer tells him he's got to get to work at Brant Leland. Jerry's like, what year is it? How how long have I been asleep? Kramer's like, you know, I'm not sure you've noticed, but lately I've been drifting aimlessly. Now that you mention it, Kramer realized he needs structure. And at Brant Leland, he's TCB, taking care of business, and he loves the people he's working with. How much are they paying you? No, no, no. I don't want any pay, he says. I'm doing this just for me. Nope, he's got to get going, and he can't forget his briefcase. What do you got in there? Crackers. (laughs) And then we see a montage to Morning Train by Sheena Easton of Kramer's Day at the office. All right, next we are in Jerry's apartment. Jerry's on the phone with George and George is getting ready to go out with Amanda. And he says, you know, she wants me to dress smart casual. What is that? I don't know, but you don't have it. He hangs up on George as Elaine enters and she's staring at Jerry, totally bewildered. Where were you today? Pick up. He's like, ah, oh, damn. Turns out Jerry was really doing nothing <laughs> except getting a paper. <laughs> Elaine says that she had to call Kevin. He had to leave his office to come pick me up. Well, what are friends for? Yes, she says, and he is a friend. He's reliable. He's considerate. He's like your exact opposite. So he's bizarro Jerry, Jerry says. Elaine has no idea what he's talking about. So Jerry explains that there was a bizarro Superman who lived in the bizarro world. Up is down, down is up. Says hello when he leaves, goodbye when he arrives. Elaine thinks about this for a second. Shouldn't he say bad bye? Isn't that the opposite of goodbye? No, it's still goodbye. Does he live underwater? No. Is he black? Okay, you know, why don't we just forget the whole thing? (laughs) Kramer enters just exhausted from the day. He needs a drink. He said people were just coming in. The phone wouldn't stop. Jerry tells him, well, we got to get going if we're going to make that cold fusion movie. Kramer says he can't go. And that old man Leland is busting his hump for these reports. If I don't get him done by nine, I'm toast. Then he chokes on his drink and <laughs> he's on his way out. And he tells them to please keep it to a low roar. Some of us have to work in the morning. <laughs> My take on this scene. All right, so this is the scene where we learn about the concept of the bizarro world and that Kevin is bizarro Jerry. Um, I love the back and forth between Elaine and Jerry. It's so great. She's just taking it so literally. (laughs) And I think it's like if you're not into, I don't know, I think if you're not into comics or any kind of sci-fi or fantasy, people who are just so literal with stuff like that, I think that's why they can't enjoy it. They're like, that would never, I don't think so. Like, <laughs> um, maybe I'm, I'm painting that with a broad stroke. But anyway, at any rate, Elaine, Elaine doesn't get this and she keeps questioning it. And it really reminded me actually um, of my son. He is in the stage of just correcting anything that's not 100% accurate. So if the clock says 828, and I dare to say it's 830 around my son, oh, I get corrected like that. (laughs) Actually, mom, it's 828. I'm like, thank you for correcting me. That was so necessary. I have to say the Kramer portion of this scene is my favorite. It is gold. Another often quoted line in this house is, phone just wouldn't stop. (laughs) More so for my husband, because it is true. I have been a witness to this. (laughs) The phone certainly doesn't stop all day for him, which is why I'm very happy he's not here right now. All right, I got to stop that. Um, (laughs) I I do actually wish we had some exchange here between Elaine and Kramer. As far as we know, 
she doesn't know what the hell Kramer is talking about. She doesn't know about this job at Brant Leland. And you can see JLD kind of like furrowing her brow going like, what, what is he talking about? But I just think it could have been a fun exchange. Uh, I don't know what it would have entailed. I'm sure Dave Mandel would have been brilliant at writing something between the two of them. Just, be, just to involve Elaine a little bit here <laughs> instead of just kind of being like, what is happening? Why is he drinking? I think it's Hennigan's. Like, what is what's going on? All right, next we are at the club. Um, George is on his date and he just absolutely loves the place. He always thought it was a meatpacking plant. Amanda introduces him to some of her model friends. Oh, modeling. What's that like? Fun? <laughs> then we hear the voiceover in George's head. Stupid, stupid. Amanda asks her friend Nikki how Paris was this time. She says, a bore. Well, George takes this opportunity to bring up his dead fiance because she loved Paris. He shows them the picture of Jillian and they're all impressed. Wow, she was beautiful. And Nikki turns to George and asks him to dance. The actress here who speaks, Nikki, uh, she's played by Shireen Crutchfield. She's also appeared in The Bold and the Beautiful, Dark Angel and The Steve Harvey Show. And she was also a member of a girl group called The Good Girls in the late 80s, early 90s. Now, I looked them up on Spotify. I, I did not um, recognize any of the songs. They did not sound familiar to me. Don't think they were hits. But I, I just like kind of scrolled through. I think there were like six or seven songs on there. Um, they all just had that deliciously like early 90s vibe. Oh, it just felt like a hug from a neon windbreaker. It was so good. Um, I just loved, I, I like, kind of kept it on for a little bit while I was doing my notes. I was like, this is a good groove. And Shireen actually is the lead singer of the group and she has a gorgeous voice. Um, anyway, back to her uh, role as Nikki. I think she's really good. She honestly has the most personality of all the female guest stars in this episode, I feel like. <laughs> I think Jillian's written really flat. Amanda's pretty flat. So Nikki kind of has some sass to her. I like her. And then the way she changes her mind immediately and asks, would you like to dance? <laughs> it's a great performance. All right, next we are in the restaurant. Jerry is on another date with Jillian. We start with a close-up of her hands. I mean, it's pretty much cl mostly close-up of her hands. <laughs> more, more hands than face. We see her hands ripping up the bread. She asks Jerry if he wants some, and he's just so disgusted. He's like, no, well, at least drink your beer. She opens it with her hands, and he says, eh, it's not a twist-off. Then she tells him, oh, you have something on your face, and he tries to get it himself. She's like, no, you're missing it. So <laughs> We see the big <laughs> meaty paw. It's like poking at his face. It's so funny. Turns out it's an eyelash. Make a wish. I don't want to. Make a wish. Okay. He closes his eyes, makes a wish, and blows on the eyelash. Opens his eyes, looks at her hands. <laughs> Didn't come true. The waiter arrives with their meals. Don't you just love lobster, Jillian says. And then we see her ripping into the lobster. And Jerry, again, is just horrified at what her man hands can do. It's another great performance. Such great expressions from Jerry. <laughs> really funny. All right, next we're at Reggie's Diner. Kevin and Elaine have arrived after visiting the Museum of Miniatures. They both had a great time. They're so tiny. Hey, guys, Kevin says, and he introduces Elaine to his friends at this booth. One is Jean, the bizarro George, and the other one is Feldman, the bizarro Kramer. Elaine can't help but say, bizarro world. My take on this scene, you know, not much to say. We know that Kevin and Elaine enjoyed their time at the Museum of Miniatures. And we see the bizarro world expand with the addition of Jean and Feldman. All right, next we are at Monk's. George is telling Jerry about the date. Just incredible models as far as the eye can see. So it does exist. And George tells him too that he's not going to go out with Amanda again. I'm inside the walls. So you're going to burn that bridge. Flame on. And Jerry's like, so when are we going? Uh, George isn't so sure that Jerry's going to fit in. You know, it's a pretty fast paced crowd. I mean, what would you wear? That? You know, I'm the one actually dating the woman in the picture, he says. Yep, George says, but I was engaged to her. All right, back at Reggie's diner, Gene and Kevin argue about the check and Gene wins, so he gets up to pay. This is unbelievable, Elaine says. Feldman asks Elaine what she thinks about his idea for an alarm clock that automatically tells you the weather when you wake up. She says, I gotta tell you, I think that's a fantastic idea, Feldman. But then he shrugs it off. He's just like, nah, yeah, it's not practical. And Kevin says, well, we have to get going, Elaine. We're going to the library. What are you going to do there? Read. So they get up to leave and Elaine waves. Hello. 
<laughs> My take on this scene, um, this scene is really about displaying the vast differences between the bizarros and their counterparts, and it's just so well done. George is cheap, Jean is generous, uh, Kramer comes up with kooky ideas and tries to execute them, while Feldman comes up with really solid ideas, but nah, doesn't think they're practical. <laughs> And they all read. Oh, it's so well done. Very good writing. And I just wanted to mention this really quick. Um, this is this reminded me, this whole episode with the Bizarro plot line reminds me of the game of the scene. The writer in me is always thinking about the structure and what they do with every scene and how they move the story along. And this this episode in particular, I said, God, this is so fun to write because it's about the game. So what I mean by that, a lot of times in improv or in a sketch show um, or even in a sitcom like this, when you find the game. So in this case, what I mean by the game here is that we have these bizarros and they're the exact opposite of George, Kramer, and Jerry. So how can we show that? We have these established characters, the established world that we've known for seven full seasons now. And now we're bringing in these guys who represent the opposite. So they probably could have had a hundred more examples of how Gene, Feldman, and Kevin differ from their counterparts. And we kind of get that in the in the tag scene of this episode, which I'll go over later. But I just, ah, I love the game of the scene here. And I can just appreciate how much fun this must have been to write. So this very much reminded me of the whole game of the scene concept, game of the plot, I guess, in this case. Um, and I think all of you writers out there, comedy writers, can appreciate the process of writing something like this. All right, next, we are in Jerry's apartment. Kramer is reading the paper while Jerry is telling him how he's going to end it with Jillian later. Kramer is just not paying attention, giving very distracted responses. Yeah, that's nice. Jerry snaps at him to put down the paper. We hardly ever talk. Well, we're talking now. So they have a very like domestic husband-wife argument about how much he's working, how Jerry doesn't see him anymore, and he's always tired. And Kramer's like, why are you getting on my case? You know it's my crazy time of year. It's your third day. Well, anyway, Kramer's got to go to work. Well, we'll talk about this later. Well, call if you're going to be late. Elaine enters when he's yelling that and is like, what's this all about? Oh, I don't want to talk about it, Jerry says. Turns out she's looking for a dress book. Oh, there it is. And she says, all right, I'll see you later. And Jerry's like, wait, wait a second. I hardly ever see you anymore. And she says, well, I guess I've been hanging out at Reggie's, the bizarro coffee shop. When she explains, you know, Kevin and his friends are nice people. They do good things. They read. I read, Jerry says. Books, Jerry. Oh, big deal. Elaine confesses to him that she can't spend the rest of her life coming into this stinking apartment every 10 minutes to pour over the excruciating minutia of every single daily event. Jerry doesn't quite understand why. I mean, for example, he just went to the bank to make a deposit and the teller gives me this look. She's like, you know what? I can't. I can't. She just exits. The whole system is breaking down. My take on this scene I love Elaine's delivery of everything here. I, I like that she's a little bit hesitant to tell Jerry where she's been, but that she's like, you know what? I shouldn't apologize. Kevin and his friends are great. <laughs> and compared to what I do here, the excruciating minutia line, I love the way she delivers that. And you can feel her total disdain for what these idiots are like now that she's gotten a taste of the bizarro world, the bizarro world that just happens to be, uh, you know, full of nice people and kind people. <laughs> Another great Jerry Seinfeld scene. I have to call that out again. I love the big deal <laughs> after Elaine points out that they read books. Oh, it's so juvenile, but so good. Okay, next we are in George's bathroom. He's getting ready to go back to the club. He's blow drying his hair. <laughs> He's got a poster of Dennis Franz behind him as inspiration. For those of you who might not know who Dennis Franz is, Franz Franz, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. I'm going with Franz because I'm so classy. Um, he was the star of a very popular drama back in the day called NYPD Blue. I never watched it. I couldn't get into it. But um, yeah, people loved that show. It was huge. Um, and he was a huge star. And another example of uh, a not so attractive guy becoming attractive because 
he was like a sex symbol on the show. <laughs> I remember being very confused by that too. At least the crotch in his pants was intact. But um, yeah, anyway, so it's really, that's the joke here that <laughs> George... <laughs> At this time, Dennis Franz was like the bald sex symbol. So George is trying to emulate what he's doing uh, with his hair, which was in actually some deleted dialogue where they talk about like, what's Dennis Franz doing? He like puffs out his hair on the bottom. I don't know. Anyway, George goes to answer the phone and we hear him off camera telling, I'm thinking Amanda, that he can't go out with her again. You know, I can't, I can't even talk about her right now. Meanwhile, the blow dryer, which he left on for some reason, sets Jillian's picture on fire. He returns to the mirror, kind of winks at himself and then smells the smoke. And he tries to put the flames out on the picture. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry has just told Jillian that he'd like to be friends. Okay, she says. Well, do you still want to see a movie later? I wish we could, but we're friends. She's like, okay. Well, she wants to go wash her hands and he points her in the direction of the bathroom and he tells her there's a beach towel on the rack. Jerry answers the phone. It's George in a panic saying he needs another picture of man hands. Otherwise, he can't get back into the forbidden city. Who is this? Jerry! Jerry says, if I get you another picture, will you take me to that place and show me a good time? Yes, yes, George says. So he goes to Jillian's purse, finds another picture. While he's holding it up, <laughs> we see uh, the big old hand grab his hand. And I think we're hearing bones cracking as well. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry is sitting in the dark waiting for Kramer. When he arrives, Jerry is all put out. He ordered in chicken and everything. And Kramer's getting a pain in his side. It's probably an ulcer. Says that this job is killing him. It's killing us. Kramer says he's right. These reports can wait. Let's go out tonight. Anywhere you want. At the coffee shop? You got it, buddy. He says, I'll call George. All right, next we are on the street. Elaine exits a shop and Jerry, George, and Kramer see her. And George thinks, oh, she could probably get me another picture of man hands. They start calling out her name. And so she looks over to them right as Kevin, Jean, and Feldman call her name from the other side down the street. The guys approach her on both sides with Elaine in the middle. Elaine introduces them to each other, and Jerry's like, this is really weird. She asks Kevin and the guys to give her a second. She turns to Jerry, George, and Kramer and asks, what? What do you guys want? George asks for another picture of Jillian. Jerry complains that while trying to get one, she almost ripped his arm out of the socket. Oh, you could have still gotten one. And they start arguing. Kramer is, meanwhile, pounding Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> Elaine turns around and sees Kevin and his friends giving money to a homeless guy. She turns back to Jerry, George, and Kramer and says, guys, I got to go. Take it easy. She turns to join Kevin and his friends when George asks if um, he could come. I'm sorry. We've already got a George. So she walks into the arms of Kevin, Jean, and Feldman, leaving Jerry, George, and Kramer just watching. All right, my take on this scene, oh, this is one of the most iconic scenes of the series. That wide shot of each trio approaching Elaine with her literally caught in the middle. Oh, I love it. Such a great visual. So here in this scene, we it's a display real time what Elaine's life would be if she chooses Jerry, George, and Kramer or defected over to the Bizarro world. I remember watching this at the time and feeling a bit of drama or sadness in that moment when she refuses to stick with Jerry, George, and Kramer. And and also JLD plays it so grounded. And you can tell like in her eyes when she says, guys, I got to go. You can tell she's excited to go into the bizarro world. I, I love that. Jerry, George, and Kramer just stand there. You know, it's not overly emotive, but just kind of low-key surprise that she's walking away from them. And then George asking to join is a great a great cut of that tension. Like, not that there's a lot of tension, but it's not a comedic moment when she says goodbye to them, when she's like, I can't, you know, like, I got to go. So George asking and her saying, we've already got a George, That that is the kind of cut of that small amount of tension. And then the visual of the, the bizarros welcoming her, like literally putting their arms around her and like embracing her into their into their world. And then we just end on seeing Jerry, George, and Kramer just watching her, watching her walk away from them. I know I'm making this way more dramatic than it needs to be, <laughs> but I tend to do that. But this is also super effective. This this sort of semi-dramatic moment is needs to be here in order to kind of get this payoff later with what happens with Elaine and the, and the bizarro world. All right, next we're back at Brant Leland. Kramer is in a meeting with Mr. Leland himself. 
And uh, Mr. Leland's not happy. He's been reviewing his work. And um, quite frankly, it stinks. Kramer's like, look, I'll work nights, weekends. No, no, that's not going to do it. These reports you handed in, it's as if you have no business training at all. I I don't know what this is supposed to be. (laughs) Kramer just doesn't even know what to say. Just trying to get ahead. So Mr. Leland basically tells him, there's no way we can keep you on. I don't even really work here. Well, that's what makes this so difficult. Um, okay, so I have to admit, I never really understood that that punchline. That's what makes this so difficult. I'm like, I, I just it never it never landed with me. So I asked my husband last night. I'm like, do you do you understand this? I'm breaking down this episode this week, and I'm just I, I've never gotten that joke. So my husband was like, well, the way I take it is that it's so difficult because he's been getting free labor. And I was like, ow, yes, that totally makes sense. (laughs) That didn't even cross my mind. So um, I guess that's the joke. And that's why it gets a big laugh. All right, next we are back at the club. George is not having any luck. He tries to talk to some woman and she's like, are you sure you're supposed to be here? He's like, yeah, no, I used to come here all the time with my fiance. And he hands her a picture. And she's like, what'd you do? Cut this out of a magazine? What? That's me from a Clinique ad I did. The bouncer comes over and tells George to leave. Sorry, private party. Ah, I'm so bummed. I could not find who this actress is. She's uncredited. I tried to find her name, but I couldn't. Anyway, whoever you are, actress at the end of this episode, um, (laughs) who calls out George's (laughs) pathetic attempt to show a picture from a magazine. Um, I think she's great. The two models at the club are the female guest stars who have the most personality in this episode. So (laughs) I think she's so great. I love the way she just like stares at him like, are you sure you're supposed to be here? (laughs) It's so great. Okay, next we're in Kevin's apartment. Elaine arrives and Kevin gives her a huge hug. Jean greets her by getting up and bowing (laughs) from the couch. She looks around and the apartment is just like Jerry's, but of course, opposite configuration and other opposite elements. She just can't believe it. She asks, what's up? Kevin says, just reading. She opens the fridge. What are you doing? Eating olives, she says. Ever hear of asking? There's a knock on the door and it's Feldman from across the hall. Hold on, Kevin says, and he unlocks the door and they greet each other. He says, look who I ran into. And then we meet Vargas, Bizarro Newman. And uh, they act like they don't like each other, but then they're good old pals. Hey, let's catch a ball game this weekend. Great, I'll see you later. Vargas. And then Feldman says, I got him. Yes, Kevin says, Elaine Feldman got us all tickets to the Bolshoi. Fourth row center. <gasps> Get out. Elaine shoves Kevin down super hard. (laughs) What's the matter with you, Jean says. Feldman and Jean have to help Kevin up onto a chair. He's just kind of clutching his stomach. Elaine apologizes. I'm so sorry. Is there there anything I can do? Haven't you done enough already? (laughs) Elaine's not welcome there anymore. She tries to leave, but she's just not used to all the locks. (laughs) She's trying to get them open. (laughs) Turns to the guys. (laughs) It's locked. My take on this scene, another just fantastic scene, one of the best scenes of the series. We get to see Kevin's bizarro apartment. Now, super mega fans will notice all the differences. They're they're like you have to kind of pause and watch and and Jerry Seinfeld mentions in the inside look that many fans have done that. So I'm just going to point out a couple. I haven't really studied it like a, like a mega fan would, but um we see a unicycle instead of a bicycle. We see pictures of horses instead of cars. We see the figurine of Bizarro Superman on the table. And instead of cereals all lined up in the kitchen, there seems to be, I guess, different grains like pastas and beans. So I feel here in this scene, the moment Elaine throws her backpack onto the chair, she is just on cloud nine about her choice. Like this is the better version for sure. She's feeling super comfortable. This is her new world now. And yeah, comfortable enough to uh, go into his fridge and start eating olives from the container. <laughs> and all it takes is Kevin saying, ever think of asking to know that, okay, she may not fit into this world. And then we get the get out shove. What a, such a brilliant way for this to end and blow up in Elaine's face. First, we, we know how much Elaine loves the ballet, Swan Lake at the Met, and that Jerry would never do it. <laughs> what does he say? Something like, no, but I've seen people on tiptoes. 
So what a perfect uh, event for Feldman to get tickets to that they would all go to together. Another example of what these bizarros will do with her that would never happen with the other guys. And then we get a classic Elaine move since pretty much the beginning of the series, since she's appeared on the series, like a, a push with the get out is a signature Elaine move for that to be what totally blows us up in the bizarro world and why she gets rejected. I just think it's absolutely perfect. You know, she's not good enough. She gets rejected to be in this group. So it's just uh, chef's kiss. And quite frankly, I think Elaine would have gotten bored eventually. If this shove hadn't happened and things were kind of smooth for a while, she has just spent too much time on the dark side to fit in with this group anyway. She needs, as, as much as she would hate to admit it, she needs the dysfunction of her old buds. Okay, next we are in the club. Well, it's not really a club anymore. <laughs> Jerry and George arrive and it's back to a meatpacking plant. Jerry is so annoyed, but George swears it was here. There's a dance floor and a bar. I'm thinking the DJ booth was behind the bone saw. Let's get out of here, George. And we see George's footstep on the Clinique ad that he had the last time he was there. All right, there's a tag to the episode, very unique, considering none of the principal characters are there. Uh, we're in the bizarro world at Kevin's apartment. Gene tells Kevin how he found a payphone that was giving free long distance. And so he called the phone company and reported the error. Nice, Kevin says. <laughs> Feldman knocks on the door and announces himself, and he's brought Kevin some groceries. Again? You know, I may not say this enough, but you both are the best friends a guy could have. And they all hug. Me so happy. Me want to cry. I want to say that's how Bizarro Superman spoke, but I don't know that for sure. I'm sure one of you could tell me. Yeah, just a great cap to the episode to have a Bizarro World scene, um, and especially having them hug. We all know Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld, the one thing they said about the show, the tone of the show from the beginning, no hugging, no learning. So I love that we see a group hug in the Bizarro World. All right, I'm going to take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. Hey guys, it's me, Shivani. Now, I know usually at this time you would hear a totally legitimate and real ad, um, but this week, I don't know, there was just this weird lull in advertisers getting in touch with me, but fear not. I do have a lovely treat for all of you. So upon hearing that James Polk was mentioned in this week's episode, my son launched into a bunch of, mom, did you know facts about the 11th president? So unbeknownst to me, my son had just written a short essay about James Polk. And he got his grade the same day we were talking about this, 95% nerd alert. So he offered me a chance to read it. And after reading it, I no longer worried that this would be my first podcast episode without an ad. So with his permission, I give you verbatim an essay about James Polk by my son, Emerson. Have you ever made an unnecessary decision? Well, at least it was not as bad as President Polk's bad decision. The war with Mexico was very unnecessary on the U.S.'s part. Polk didn't do the most reasonable things, like an unnecessary outburst. This war was not needed. The war was not necessary because Polk provoked Congress into declaring war. He lied about the quote-unquote American soil, and it wasn't necessary. Polk just had a breakout at the worst time possible. When Polk requested, let alone demanded, Congress go to war, he made false statements saying that quote-unquote American blood was found on quote-unquote American soil. This is so false because the land the Mexicans attacked on was unclaimed at the time. Again, it is totally unnecessary to exaggerate a situation to go to war. It was unneeded, and it would have saved a lot of lives and time not to go to war. This leads us right into our next reason. This takes us into our next reason. The soil the soldiers were found dead on was not, quote, American soil. Polk just said that to simply trigger Congress even more. 
He provoked Congress into declaring war because he completely over-exaggerated the fact that his soldiers died. Back to the point. The land the soldiers were found dead on was the 150 miles that they were arguing about. This land was not claimed. This was the land that they fought about for months until they went to war, not American soil. Oh my God! Exclamation point. Polk angers me so much! Exclamation point. The last reason is really just common sense. War is dangerous. I mean, do we really need families depressed over a family member who died in war? No! and 150 miles is relatively small to fight over. I've mentioned this before, and I'm going to mention it again. Polk exaggerated, double exclamation point. He lied too, exclamation point. I mean, come on. Isn't it obvious that a wide range of land like, say, 150 miles is not claimed? I mean, come on. Whether it was a life-threatening injury or just a death alone, it is never needed. We don't need to bring even more death into this situation just for land and justice. I don't know about you, but war is so harmful to families, especially young family members, animals, and more! Exclamation point. Polk really doesn't know what lying can really affect. Sometimes, unnecessary decisions affect little to nothing. On the other hand, Polk's decision led to war. It's your choice, but avoiding unnecessary decisions is probably the way to go. This unnecessary war went wrong because of President James Knox Polk. His decision to lie to and provoke Congress into declaring war was unacceptable. Polk had a breakout that was completely unhinged and was not needed. Even if there was a lot of death throughout that 150 miles, we didn't have to bring more death into this situation by forcing Congress to declare war. And we're back. Okay, so there were a few extras for this episode. Uh, Dave Mandel, who is the writer of this episode and a future showrunner of Veep. So he and, he and JLD reunite years in the future after Seinfeld. Um, he talked about, I thought this was interesting, he talked about how the second generation of writers had the advantage of coming in with six years of being a fan of the show. So he talks about how he came in and a bunch of new writers came in in season seven. So they had an advantage. He's like, quite frankly, we, we all thought it was an advantage. We were fans of the show. And then we got to write for the show, which just made for really fun episodes. And I tend to agree. Um, in the commentary, which was done by Dave Mandel, <laughs> he says that the inspiration for Manhands was his own wife. He says that I lovingly call her farm hands. She's just got very sturdy hands, but he thought that Manhands was funnier for the script. Um, in the notes about nothing, there was some revealed deleted dialogue that didn't make it into the episode that Gene was an architect and that his firm was responsible for the Guggenheim expansion and uh, that it took a long time to do, he tells Elaine. So this is the exact opposite of what um, George tells to Duncan Meyer and Jerry and Lois when he pretends to meet Jerry after years. Lies about being an architect, lies about doing the Guggenheim expansion and says, yeah, it didn't take that long either. So again, this is m more examples of how like playing that game of the plot where you can just keep writing all the opposites. And I, so I thought that was really funny <laughs> that Gene was actually an architect. All right, let's move on to Greg's sack lunch. Every week, Greg, who is our most dedicated contributor, he sends us a sack full of his thoughts. So here in his sack, I find his overall thoughts. He says, I remember this episode being much funnier when I originally watched it all those years ago. It does feel a lot more goofy than a lot of prior episodes of the show, and I wonder if that has to do with Larry David's departure. To me, the funniest bit in all of this was the manhands. But there's only so much you can do with that, which is why they had Jerry tie into the other three stories. While Elaine gets a funny story here with the Bizarro friend group, I wish it had given us something a little more than it did. George's story is also somewhat poorly executed, and I wished it was just a bit more about the receptionist he had hit it off with versus the secret club that he was getting into. 
It was funny that where in so many episodes we see Elaine or George at the office, that this time it was Kramer alone we saw working. Um, I think we disagree a little bit. I think, oh man, I think this episode stands up. I think it's one of the best ones. Um, I do see, I do see your points though. I feel like we could have expanded a little bit more on um, Elaine's story. I, that that to me is the funniest. I think Manhands is really funny as well. Um, but yeah, I think overall we we I think I like this episode a little bit more than you do, Greg, or maybe a lot more than you do. All right, moving on in Greg Sack, favorite scenes and Elaine moments. He says, Elaine has some fun moments with the Bizarro group. And my favorite scene is the last one of hers where she is at Kevin's apartment. And basically all they're doing is the exact opposite of what her real friends do. My favorite part about this is really the apartment itself and the fact that there is a unicycle instead of a bicycle hanging in the hall. I love how Elaine walks in and just throws her purse down and raids the fridge and how Kevin calls her out on it. She can't even respond because technically these guys have manners and she's the wrong one. Exactly, Greg. The whole point of that scene is to put on display how, yeah, Elaine doesn't belong in this world. She, she's, <laughs> she's been corrupted. <laughs> she's too corrupted to be this polite. And yes, the apartment is, it's a masterpiece. How fun I'm sure that was to make the opposite of Jerry's apartment. Just all those details. Really, really great job by the set design. Next, Greg says, I like when Elaine sets up Jerry with man hands and how she has the stats of the woman written on the photo for him. This could have been better written overall, but I also like how it comes back around when he complains about man hands and Elaine says, would you rather she have no hands at all? While I get Elaine's point, there's no way she would not think the same thing as Jerry about those massive claws. <laughs> I know. I didn't mention it when I was I was going over that scene, and I meant to actually, but like, yeah, I mean, look, it's the, the man hands are so overly ridiculous with how big they are. <laughs> I mean, they're literally a man's hand uh, in the shots. But um so yeah, I think that for the sake of Elaine just getting exhausted with Jerry and his tendencies and the other guys uh, and making Kevin and the Bizarros more attractive to her. That's why that scene has to be played that way. But yeah, I think, of course, like, I don't know, has she never noticed Jillian's hands? I don't get it, <laughs> but I think it all works. I forgive it. And even though, to your point, Greg, there's no way Elaine wouldn't be horrified by her hands. We needed to see her getting frustrated with Jerry in that moment. Greg goes on to say, the scene where both friend groups approach Elaine on the street is somewhat iconic. I love when George asks to come along and she says, we already have a George. Something about that moment actually made me sad. Oh my God. Okay. We're totally on the same page there. <laughs> I know. I did too. I was like, oh, <laughs> when she's like, guys, I gotta go. You know, it was a little shocking. First, I was shocked by the hair in the last episode. And then this, it's like they were really playing with my heart in 1996. All right, next in Greg's sack is his scene swap idea. He says, everything in this episode is somewhat silly, and yet I don't love a lot of it. Kramer's montage at the office felt really long, and the tie-in with him disappointing Jerry by not being around seemed sort of thrown in. I'd have liked to have seen more of Elaine tied into the manhands thing, or even more so with George's plot to use the fake Susan photo. Elaine could have been hanging out with fashion models. She's in the industry. But that wasn't even mentioned. Everyone's story needed more, and because you had so much separately going on, it didn't tie together at all. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I don't disagree that we could have had Elaine kind of bleed into the other storylines. I think I think either would have made sense, like you said, um, George's or Jerry's. I'm not sure what she could have done at Brant Leland, probably nothing. Um, but I I, I kind of like the idea of incorporating maybe the bizarros in with Jillian. Maybe she sets Jillian and Kevin up and like he loves her hands or something. I don't mean that that would have been, I think, a little heavy handed pun intended. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I do. I, I definitely get your point there, Greg. Spoiler alert. I actually had no notes to improve this episode, but you make some really solid points here. And I think that, um, yeah, Elaine being tied into man hands or the models could have been better. Because look, I mean, a Ben Estanza moment with George 
trying to get into this club. Elaine would definitely have a lot to say about that. But at the same time, let's not forget, she is also in the process of distancing herself. She's sick of these guys. So I think maybe deliberately they're like, you know what, she needs to be on her own with the Bizarros um, instead of like putting her into these storylines. All right, next in Greg Sack, I find his extra thoughts. He says, Something about George having a Dennis Franz poster in his bathroom cracks me up. It's simple, but great for a laugh. Totally. That's why I kind of wanted to explain it. I mean, I feel like anyone listening to this podcast is from that era anyway. (laughs) But um, yeah, it's so simple, so funny. And it's interesting because in the notes about nothing, they kind of, they point out like how, oh, this this poster sort of comes out of nowhere. It was supposed to tie in with the deleted dialogue before that I had mentioned where they, they were walking down the street and they were just kind of criticizing how Dennis Franz does his hair. I think there was more to it even. Like they talk about how he kind of blow dries it and puffs it out and how George is like, well, maybe I can try that. And Jerry says something like, you don't have enough volume down there or something like that. Anyway, so the poster was, it was kind of like a callback to that moment. But I think it works even without that moment. It's still hilarious. <laughs> and it's not a little poster. It's a ginormous poster. Next, Greg says, Pat Kilbane, who plays Feldman in this episode, is married to a woman named Melissa, who I actually know. She used to host karaoke night at Barney's Beanery in LA. And I would go there and hang and celebrities would be there all the time. It was such a cool spot. Never met Pat Kilbane, but seeing him in this episode reminded me. He was also on Mad TV early on, and both he and his wife are big in the L.A. improv scene. Oh, I believe it. Yeah, I do remember him from Mad TV, definitely. I think he's also really funny as Feldman. (laughs) I like that little clock thing and the, no, no, it's not practical. Um, But so cool, Greg, that you have a connection. Um, Maybe you can hook me up with an interview. I don't know. Um, Just putting that out there. No. Greg actually put that out there, everyone. (laughs) He offered to maybe make a connection. Maybe I can have Feldman on the podcast. That would be pretty exciting. Next, Greg says, I have to mention Elaine's hair. Since she cut it crazy short in the last episode, seeing the small perm or pinned up made me realize they kind of had to keep that going. I think by the next episode, she goes back to her regular look. Yes, and they point that out in the notes about nothing as well. Like, (laughs) this doesn't really track with the timeline. But like I said, if it means we didn't have to see Elaine with that awful, awful haircut at the end of The Soulmate, I'm fine with it. I will let all that shit go. I don't care. (laughs) Maybe she got in touch with Zhang Zhao and got the Chinese uh, ointment or whatever. (laughs) for her to grow her hair really long. That's what I'm going with. And then, she, you know, her head stunk for a few days, but it grew out enough for it to be not so horrifying to look at. And finally, Greg says, George's mentioning of the bathroom in the office building being the best in Midtown was actually an interesting thing to hear now that I live in New York. This is a thing because restaurants don't allow non-customers to use their restrooms here. It is sort of an art of knowing where bathrooms are available and which ones are not grody. Oh, nice use of grody. Haven't heard that in a while. (laughs) There's actually now an app called Got To Go that people actually use. George should have invented it. Holy shit. Okay. that. Sorry, I paused and read that kind of weird. But um, so in Curb Your Enthusiasm, if any of you watched the season where they did the Seinfeld reunion, future George in the reunion had invented and made millions inventing the app, which tells you which bathroom is the best in your vicinity. And it was called the eye toilet. <laughs> but that he invested his money with Bernie Madoff and lost it all but got to go. So there was another Curb episode where Leon comes up with an app. Was it called Got to Go? I feel like it was where he provided a service to workers who couldn't leave their post because of whatever the job was, like people who worked in like the booths at a parking garage or a guy at a newsstand, like they can't leave because they're the only ones there. So he invented an app where they could request him and he would sit in for them while they went to the bathroom. (laughs) I feel like it was called Got to Go. Um, But that's so funny that there's an actual app called that. I wonder if that's based on uh, Curb. Anyway, um, thank you so much, Greg, for all of your thoughts. We always love them every week. We, now I said we again, and I mean me and all the other listeners. And now it's time to close Greg's sack lunch. All right, moving on to my favorite Elaine moments. I just love that that scene 
in the diner when she's like, would you rather she had no hens? Um, do hooks make it more attractive, Jerry? I just love the whole vibe of that scene. The dialogue is great. JLD is great. So I love that scene. But a close second is the excruciating minutia um, that moment as well. I just, I love the acting in both of those moments and they're pretty much even to me. And my final notes. Um, well, unlike Greg, I think this is a near perfect episode. I, I really have no major criticisms or notes other than kind of what I was influenced to say after uh, Greg's notes. I mean, I do think we could have had Elaine a little bit more involved in other, in other storylines, but then I backtracked and I'm going to do it again now. <laughs> she was distancing herself to get into the bizarro world. Anyway, um, all the storylines to me were just very funny. And uh, yeah, I just thought they all worked nicely. Uh, focusing on Elaine's story, though, it's just such a well done peek into Elaine. Finally, if just for a day or two, escaping these idiots that she's friends with, and entering what seems to be greener pastures. Now, Dave Mandel said something that I thought was interesting. He talks about how in the post Larry David era of the show, there was a lot of writing for Elaine where she was trying to get out of this situation, being friends with these guys. And so this is one of those examples. And the fact that she was the one who was rejected, like I said before, just perfect. Bravo to Dave Mandel. He is such a fantastic writer. And as he said, like he came in with six years under his belt of being a Seinfeld fan, which clearly just makes you a better writer for Seinfeld. <laughs> I think this Bizarro storyline is easily one of the best character plots of the entire series, and I'm so glad that JLD got it, and we got to see her play with it. And one last thing, I've said this before on the podcast, but I feel I need to mention it because of the Manhands plot. Um, I have been known to have Manhands. Um, it's been pointed out to me. I uh, have a hard time finding bangles and being Indian. Bangles are a big part of, uh, you know, wearing an Indian outfit and getting all dressed up. And I have broken many a bangle because they just cannot go around <laughs> my hands. <laughs> Clearly, these are designed for very dainty hands. And that is not me. So I just wanted to acknowledge my own manhandedness as we close this episode. And with that, that's all I can say about the Bizarro Jerry. Please be sure to follow the pod on social media, on Instagram at Hot Heavy Elaine, TikTok at Elaine Bennis Podcast. And if you'd like to email me, please do at ElainePodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time.